as long as we have any written history, people have tried to understand what does it mean to govern a society? Or what does it mean to mobilize people in your society to adapt to changing conditions? These are ancient questions. But strangely enough, we don't have a commonly accepted vocabulary for uh, analyzing the terrain of leadership in modern society. So terms like power, influence, authority, management, leadership, citizenship aren't defined. And to the average person who reads a book, uh, the same uh, words will be used very differently by different authors. Um, that's not true in a mature discipline like economics, where two economics economists may disagree, but they both agree on the relationship between a supply and a demand, or on the uh, meaning of the term average cost or marginal utility. So we're at an intellectual frontier in the study of leadership. Uh, and those of us who want to develop and improve the practices of leadership, or coach or consult the people who are trying to practice leadership need a more uh, expert uh, analytical vocabulary in order to see the world with greater distinction and differentiation um, and clarity um, and, and therefore to provide more acute kinds of prescriptions. I think it's very important diagnostically to begin to distinguish the parts of a complex challenge that are technical and can therefore, tr can therefore be treated with authoritative command and expertise, and those parts of a problem that are adaptive and require the development of new capacity for, the, uh, f for people to be able to solve the problem uh, in new ways. Many of the problems that you consider to be intractable are bundled. There are parts of the problem that are technical and can be then treated with known solutions, uh, known uh, skill, uh, and with authoritative command. But most of these problems also have components that are adaptive and require leadership rather than authoritative management. Um, because we frequently confuse the two, indeed the most common source of failure in leadership that I've seen in decades of study is that people treat adaptive challenges as if they were technical problems. So the first task is diagnostic. Uh, how does one unbundle the technical from the adaptive dimensions of a problem? And in that regard then, in pushing this frontier, there are diagnostic indicators. There are indicators to help you tease out a challenge to determine is it 80% technical and 20% adaptive, or is it 70% uh, adaptive and 30% technical? You know, the ratio will change, and what are the indicators that tell you that the problem is only partly technical. And there are indicators, like persistent conflict, uh, like sometimes you can tell from the beginning that new uh, attitudes will need to be developed, that there's a departure from historical cultures. It may only be a 3% departure angle, but it's nevertheless still a departure. Uh, you m it, persistent uh, repeated crises are frequently a symptom. Um, dramatic forms of what I would call work avoidance by work avoidance, I mean efforts of a society to restore equilibrium, uh, even if it means avoiding the adaptive parts of the problem, sort of reaching for a technical fix. These dramatic forms of work avoidance sometimes are the clues or diagnostic indicators that there was an adaptive challenge that one needs to then identify. So one sort of works backwards from the avoidance pattern. The avoidance pattern might be assassination, frequently somebody, or neutralization. Or, um, uh, or marginalization, uh, or a civil war. Um, these are all dramatic manifestations of people reaching for some technical solution for an adaptive challenge. Um, so as we begin to define these diagnostic indicators, then we can help people in the development world move into various situations where they help then clients disaggregate a complex challenge, break it into various components, some of which are technical and some of which then uh, are adaptive and require then a different mode of operating than simply authoritative command. And we can then help people uh, learn what it will take uh, by coaching them and, and, and teaching them and, and, and building from their skill set 
in providing the kind of leadership to mobilize uh, progress on these adaptive challenges. The, the common misconception is that people resist change. People actually love change when they know it's a good thing. I don't know anybody in any country that gives back a winning lottery ticket. People love change when they expect it to be a good thing. People welcome a raise in their salary, unless the raise is associated with something they don't want to do. What people resist is not change per se. What people resist are changes that are associated with losses or the potential for losses. One way to think about leadership is that you're taking people from a history through current future, the current present, into a future. You're trying to move from a history through a present, your time, into a future. And therefore, you're always dealing with taking people and, and helping them depart from some history. It may not be a radical departure in terms of discarding 50% of their culture or 80% of their culture. It may be simply the discarding of 30, uh, 3% or 5% of their cultural DNA. But that 3 or 5% is not easy to lose. The losses are really significant. And one has to be then an acute diagnostician of these kinds of losses. The ways in which people are going to have to experience accusations of betrayal from their ancestors or from their community or, for, or from their professional surround in making these departures. Uh, teaching people how to renegotiate a loyalty, how to strain a loyalty, but then how to manage that, that, that process over time where people finally come to understand why there's the need for that departure. Or helping people push the frontier of their competence and therefore having to experience the loss of competence and the experience of shame or, or the loss of pride in their competency. Well, frequently in leadership you're trying to build new capacity. And that means then you're trying to bless incompetence and help people feel more at home in learning through you know, version 1.1 to version 1.2 through failure and mistakes without feeling embarrassed. So there are losses that need to be understood because uh, one has to be able to anticipate the sources of resistance to change and indeed to map the stakeholding communities to identify who is going to need to learn what if we're going to make progress on this collective challenge. And that learning process is not often cost free. So one needs to understand then uh, with a lot of heart and with a lot of reverence for those pains of change, uh, what that learning is going to require. There are a lot of people in leadership who are enthusiastic about the change, but they don't spend enough time honoring the traditions and the heritage and the history to build from. And then, then they frighten people because they only talk about the change rather than also talking about the values and the, and the, and the, and the tradition uh, that needs to be honored that in fact make the change worth doing, that make the change worth suffering through because it will enable us then to thrive and, and still continue to be what's most essential and precious to us in our core identity or heritage. So as an antidote to that kind of grandiosity where somebody with their enthusiasm thinks they've got a solution for a society or another or a community uh, and then parachute in and fix it, um, understanding that adaptive processes of nature start with honoring the processes that exist already and then figuring out what adaptation can bring the best of that history into the future, um, I think can begin to uh, serve as an antidote against, against that kind of untempered enthusiasm. And many times we're under such a rush to restore equilibrium fast that we put enormous pressure on people in authority to treat these adaptive problems as if they were technical and get it done. Give us a result now. But in nature, it takes time to innovate. It takes time to tinker, to fail, to tinker again, to fail again, and to accumulate wisdom into a, finally, a new a new innovative uh, uh, way of operating. 
And I think then in, in leadership then, one has to have a longer time frame in mobilizing uh, new adaptations in a community. Then if you're trying to manage organizational innovation, the, mod the creating modular spaces for innovative work and carrying that modularization becomes critically important. For example, the World Bank started an initiative as a, as a home for econom economists and engineers. It started an initiative to try to increase its implementation rate. And one of those initiatives was to create um, uh, a, a leadership uh, consulting or leadership advising methodology. Well, that methodology is embryonic. It's going to require a lot of trial and error and a lot of failure along the way. Can the organization sustain many years of trial and error as it moves from version 1.0 to 1.1 to 1.2 to 2.0 and so forth? You know, Windows didn't begin to sell until Windows 3.0. It went through a lot of versions before it got to 3.0. So creating a, uh, a safe harbor for innovation so that, the, so that it can afford to undergo trial and error as it figures out how to work this problem of implementation is critically important. And unfortunately, many times, you know, people want to get it fast and, okay, we've given you enough time, you know, and, uh, and we're going to close down the shop uh, and go back to our, our previous mode of operating. This modularization that we see in nature begins to give us insight into how to take a healthy organization and spend you know, the, the general welfare to buy time for the innovative laboratory and, and protect it as a greenhouse, giving it permission to fail, not be ashamed of its failures, so that it can learn rapidly uh, from its mistakes and, and, and then begin to work the fundamental problem that the organization asked it to do originally, for example, in the World Bank's case, uh, increase the implementation success rate.